What is up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Hockey Town University. You are here with me once again, your host, Zach, with his lovely co-hosts, Derek and Matt Leslie. Boys, it's still playoff season. How are the playoff beards coming, Leslie? Well, as I've already described, I am not allowed to grow one. But if I were allowed to, I mean, I guess I kind of have one right now. That's because I haven't shaved in two days. I've been slacking a little bit. But... Yeah, playoffs are definitely very exciting. Um, this weekend, I went to see Luke Combs in concert. Fucking incredible concert. I don't think I'll live the rest of my life and see a better one. It was amazing. There was over 50,000 people there at Ford Field. One of the biggest concerts. I think it was like the third largest in the history of Ford Field. So, absolutely insane day. We were packed in like sardines, but... He blew the roof off the place, man. It was actually funny. My girlfriend was standing next to me. She pointed out. She was like, he's done three songs, and he's already ripped his shirt. He had, like, a rip in his sleeve. So he had to, like, go back and put on, like, a Lions Letterman jacket. It was really funny. But, yeah, that was an incredible concert. And, yeah, we're, we're just all over here enjoying the playoffs for the time that we have them. You know, it's it seems like. You're just enjoying wall-to-wall games one day, and the next day it's the finals, and it's almost gone. So definitely got to live in the moment there with that. But, man, playoff time is so much fun. Just all the highlights I've been watching, everybody beating the crap out of each other. Oh, the Toronto series right now, probably my favorite, just because Toronto doesn't want to lose in the first round so bad again. But, whew, they are just destroying each other, and it's fun to watch. Yeah, we'll talk we'll talk about that because I have a little tidbit about that game as well uh later on when we get to the around the league news. Uh Derek, uh let's go ahead and backtrack. Last episode you asked me a question, what team has made the highest jump in a draft lottery? I found out. Granted, I did find out after we recorded because I wanted to find out. Um, but it was the Philadelphia Probably ten Lions. seconds after we recorded. Yeah, they, Philadelphia Flyers jumped from 13th to 2nd overall uh, with a 2.4% chance to jump to that spot, and they selected Nolan Patrick, the bust himself. Uh, supposedly, a little fun fact for you guys, the Flyers were actually pre- prepared to draft Kale McCarr that draft, uh, but the coach at the time pounded on the table for Nolan Patrick instead because they wanted to develop their number one centerman of the future. Uh, that didn't work out very well, as you guys can see. And I'm sure that they're very upset that they do not have a Kale McCarr who won the playoffs last year. So that really sucks, but it's what you get. You got to have good uh, development. You got to have good scouts, and that's just the name of the game. So hopefully that doesn't happen to us. Hopefully it's on Am Fantilli's situation if we do get the second overall pick. But uh, yeah, other than that, what we have for you guys today, we are going to do our part two of the grades for all the players. We are going to touch on the defensemen, the goalies, and then we will do our overall team grade as well. Uh, but before that, we will touch on some Red Wings news, around the league news, and then after we do the player's assessment, we will do a player draft prospect profile of the Russian phenom, not Ovi, but Metve Michkov, Derek's favorite boy. Because he likes Russians for whatever reason. I don't know why. Uh, you're not Russian, are you? It's a fun topic right now. I'm, I'm are very you? little Russian, actually. Oh. Hmm. Okay. I'm very close to them, but. Well, all right. He's right so, next door. He's right a next door neighbor. <laughs> yes, he is. Knock, knock. All right. Yep. Let's go ahead and kick it off with some Red Wings news. Um, no news, honestly, really. As really with just the Red Wings. But we're patiently waiting for the draft lottery, which is on May 8th. Uh, We might go live with that. Um, I was kind of hoping to do that all in the same place. But obviously, since it's on a Monday, that's kind of impossible for us. So, uh, But yeah, stick around with us. We'll possibly be able to do that. So wait around and maybe you'll get some news on that. Another news for the Red Wings, Toledo walleye goaltender John Letteman wins the ECHL Goalie of the Year. In the 26 games that he started, he posted an 18-1-3 record. 1.99 1.99 goals against and a 9.30 save percentage. Toledo leads their playoff series two to zero currently as well. Um, you guys want to touch on that a little bit? Good for him. I think that's great. Um, I also think that that's great for Kosa. You know, to be behind someone who's capable of doing something like that. So, 
Leslie, it looked like you had something you wanted to touch on. Yeah, that that's a big accomplishment for that guy. I mean, he's he's kind of been down in um, Toledo longer than Cosa has, so it's I don't he's I guess that you wouldn't really, really call him like a veteran at this point, but that's a good person for Cosa to get behind and learn under. And it's not like Cosa's been the backup. I mean, he's had a they've had a healthy split of starts. Like Cosa's started mm-hmm. a healthy amount of games, so he's got some good experience behind him and. I think even this award is kind of just a testament to how good that Toledo Walleye team is because your goalie is not really going to be playing out of his mind and be the best of the best if everyone in front of you is a defensive liability. So, yeah, that's awesome news for them and the team. And I got to figure that the Walleye have some of the better chances in the league to win, what is it, the Kelly Cup they play for? Whatever their cup is, whatever that championship is, I got to imagine they have a really good chance of winning it. That's I mean, that team is stacked from top to bottom. They just got uh, some of the uh, AHLers from Grand Rapids to come and join the team for the playoff run. So, yeah, we're all rooting for them over here in Hockeytown University, and I really think they can go all the way. I don't see why not. Yeah, no, I believe that they have a chance to make it all the way. I believe that they made it to the finals last year as well, so maybe that momentum is carrying into this year, so that's great to see. Um, Derek, do you want to touch on we, the we Toledo Wadi at all with the goaltending? I mean, it's a great thing to see happening right now, especially with a team that I've grown up with back to when they were the, the Toledo Storms and everything like that. That's where I started watching them, and they became the Walleye, and it's just a great, like, watch them slowly progress. I mean, it's been a long progression of, like, 20 years of me watching them now, but the fact that they made it this far and the fact that the goaltending's the way it is between Kosa and Letterman right now, it's like, you can't really say no to either of them, like, I know the one dude's a little bit older now, and like Leslie said, it's a good person for Kosa to be underneath. And it sounds like it might be a good transition for one of them to move up to the AHL here soon, and hopefully that helps our goalie situation up in the NHL with the Detroit Red Wings. So hopefully uh, with what they're doing right now in that league, it progresses up to both other leagues too, and it helps us out in the long run. Yeah, 100%. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Let's go ahead and talk about the other topics as well that I have for Red Wings news. The Detroit Tigers have a new home run celebration. I don't know if you guys saw that, but their new celebration is you put on uh, the Red Wings or the Red Wings, the Tigers, after they hit a home run, the player comes back into the dugout and they have a uh, special Red Wings helmet. It's red and it has the Red Wings logo on it that they put on. Uh, They grab a hockey stick as well, and then they try to, you know, we'll not try it, but they pretend to rip a slap shot with a stick too. So I thought that was pretty cool. I thought that was nice homage to the Detroit Red Wings with the Tigers since they're both products of Little Caesars, you know, so owned by the same person. So I thought that was pretty cool to see. Um, this one might hurt your guys' soul a little bit. It's not team related, but Tyler Bertuzzi joined Bo- some of Boston's elite players as the fifth player in Bruins history to collect a point in each of his first four career playoff games. And I have a sad face on that as well. Uh, Who's sad about that? Is anyone else just as sad as I am that uh, this is someone that we could have kept and could have done that for us in the playoffs? I I think it's just like a matter of perception. I I still think that if those two Ottawa games didn't happen the way they did, he would have stayed on the team and maybe even get an addition or just roll in the way they were. But yeah, he's been the playoff performer that we all know he could have been in Detroit. And it's not like we haven't seen this before. I mean, he was doing this in the AHL level when they went on to win the uh, the oh my god, Calder. what's the trophy? Um, uh, Calder Trophy, yeah, the Calder Cup. When they went on to win that, I mean, that he was, I think he won playoff MVP for that whole run. So he did. yeah, I the, I I am not surprised at all that he has turned into this player. It's definitely something to mention that he's playing with some world-class players right now in the playoffs. And not to mention, they're getting this all done without their captain, Patrice Bergeron. So, yeah, we we do not like that team over in Boston on this podcast, but I do got to give them props. They look really dangerous. So, yeah, good for Bert. I hope he keeps it up. You know, I can put aside my Bruins hate when I'm watching him play, and I'm just happy for him whenever he can score in a big moment. Derek, you want to add in your two cents about Tyler Bertuzzi's playoff performances so far, too? I mean, more so in general, I'm just upset that it's not for the Red Wings right now. But at least he's doing well. I still love his play. I love his scrappy attitude. I love how he just gets in there. He fits well with the Boston Bruins. That's all I can say in general. So, I mean, that's a team that we all hate aggressively. 
and everybody knows why. So, I mean, it's weird to see him over there. It fits in really well, but I still wish he was on the Red Wings. But I'm happy to see he's doing well over there, and that's a team that we have to look out for because, obviously, they're the best in the league this year and in history and wins. And they're probably going to pull something off crazy in the playoffs, I'm going to imagine. Of course, I don't have them winning, but at the same time, they are a serious contender. So what can you do about that? So good on looks on Bertuzzi. I hope he makes it. I mean, it's pretty sad to see Tyler Bertuzzi doing this. I kind of do wish that it was with the Red Wings, kind of like how you guys were talking about as well. And you're right, Leslie. You know, this is someone who showed us that he could do that in the AHL. The questions were, could he produce that at the NHL? Unfortunately, he just never got that opportunity with the Red Wings. It really does suck. Um, but good for him. I think that's great. Um, It'll be interesting to see if he does re-sign with the Boston Bruins. I don't think it'll happen. I would love for him to come back to the Red Wings. I also don't think that that's going to happen. So, But if you guys think I'm wrong, go ahead and leave it down in the comments. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and mention thanks for joining us. For those of you that are returning, for those of you that are new, thanks for joining us. And as always, make sure that you're hitting the subscribe button. That really does go help and help us out. Uh, grow our channel, helps us out that much more to provide more content for you guys and for others that enjoy listening about Red Wings news, hockey news in general as well. So yeah, make sure you're doing all those things and rate us five stars on Spotify as well. Bye. So let's go ahead and kick off some around the league news. Uh, this one might be a shocker to some of you. Some of you might not, but Jack Eichel scores his first playoff goal Thursday night in his second game of the series. Uh, it's pretty crazy to think that this is his first year in the playoffs uh, since he's been in the league since 2015-16. Anyone else shocked? Not really, no. I mean, being on Buffalo those entire all those years, no, I'm not really that shocked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I was about to say, knowing his history and where he's been playing pretty much his whole career, can't really say I'm too surprised. But I think when you're talking about it in the scope of, like, are you surprised he's this player in the playoffs? No, I'm not at all. I really thought that he would be a big game changer in the playoffs. And so far, he's looked like that. So I'd say, like... I haven't been paying too much attention to this series just because it's always late. And by that time, I've already watched like three or four hours of hockey. So I'm, at that point, I'm just ready for bed. But it seems like him and Mark Stone are, I'd have to give him the MVP for this playoffs for the Golden Knights. They look really good. So I know we all like the Knights on this podcast. Zach and Derek were one of the first Golden Knights fans in history. Uh, don't go fact check that because I don't think there's any evidence that you'll find. But just Probably believe zero. when I say that. Um, yeah, we're all rooting for the Knights. It looks like my Islanders are going to get absolutely smoked. They're jokes. They're losers. So I'll root for the Knights with you guys. How about that? Yeah, let's go ahead and talk about some other series. So the playoffs continue to roll out. Some teams completed their fourth game today as we record. It is currently 8.20 p.m. Sunday, April 23rd, uh, 2023. Um, but Derek mentioned this. So let's go ahead and talk about this. Uh, before I ask the next next question for you guys. But Steven Stamkos versus Austin Matthews in last night's game after the hit on Braden Point from Morgan Riley into the boards. Uh, that did, did end in overtime with Toronto taking the lead 2-1 to one in the series. What did you guys think about that hit? And what did you guys think about that fight? That was the fight I never thought that was ever going to happen. And honestly, they made me very, very happy to see. And I was very happy Stamkos did that to Matthews. But I felt bad for Matthews because he was just standing there. And he's like, why is this old guy just beating me in the face with his fist? I, <laughs> Calm down, Gramps. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't really a fair fight, but, you know, he got a crap punch out of his face and they split apart. I'm like, he grabbed the nearest guy to him to beat the crap out of him because he was upset. And I'm like, honestly, I'm okay with that. That's the fight we needed. That's the fight we wanted. And the fact that it's been happening through the entire series so far, it was pretty entertaining. <laughs> Did it need to happen? Probably not, but I'm content with it happening. The hit, eh, but, you know, point to live. It's okay. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Gotta take I, out the best one of the best players on the team. Yeah, I didn't really get to touch on the hit, but um, the hit was meh, kind of like you said. I mean, there was a little shove, um, but I think at the end of the day, it kind of did look like Brayden Point just kind of messed up on a skate a little bit. Uh, he might have toe-picked a little bit there and just kind of I think he's got a broken collarbone, but he managed to come back in the game. Um, I didn't think it was intentional for Morgan Riley to do that and to hurt him. Um, I've never pegged Morgan Riley as someone who is a dirty player by any means. So I guess it's kind of similar to like a Matt Dumba thing, like Leslie said in the last episode, but I think there was just a penalty on it. 
from what I remember. Actually, I think Toronto got the power play at the end of it. So I don't know how that worked, but that's how it happened. Um, they did. It, it, they ended up having the penalty. It was kind of funny. <laughs> Leslie, what do you think about the whole entire thing, the fight and the hit? Yeah, I got to be completely honest with you guys. I did not have Matthews and Stamkos on my Stanley Cup playoffs fight bingo card, but it happens. And as far as the hit goes, I don't really feel like it was all that bad. I mean, I think he got a five-minute major from it, which it kind of just seemed like the way he was hit, it was kind of like an awkward little contact. And and then he ended up going into the boards in a way that I don't think Riley intended for him to go. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is as far as, like, borderline dirty hits going in the playoffs, that was pretty tame, yeah. if I'm being completely honest. But, I mean, I get it. Like, tensions are high in this series. Like, this is this is really, the way I see it, Toronto's last chance to get out of the first round with this core because I would not be surprised if it doesn't happen this year, they break them up a little bit. So, yeah, yeah I, I think Toronto was just playing, like, just knowing what's at stake and knowing that they just need to do it at some point. And, you know, I originally predicted Tampa in seven. It's looking like a bad prediction now. Like, I, it could be the Leafs, you know? I would not be shocked. I would not be shocked if this is the year they can do it. And we talked about how bunting being gone for three games might be actually beneficial to Toronto. It's actually kind of working out for them in their favor. They've won their last two games ever since bunting's been I out. I think it is. Well, yeah. granted, you look at Tampa Bay, they've lost three players. They didn't have Hedman. They don't have Chernak. And I believe there was one other player that I can't think of. I'm sorry, I'm not a Tampa fan, and I'm not trying to keep up with them as best as possible. But if you guys know, please let me know in the comments as well. Get, make Help me do my job, please. I'd appreciate that. Um, but let's go and talk about the other series. Do you guys have any – are there any surprises so far that you guys have noticed? Carolina's up 3-1, to one, so that might be yours, Leslie. Um, I think it's crazy that the Kings are beating the Oilers two to one. Um, Boston's up three to one now. Uh, New Jersey won last I mean, the night. Dallas, Minnesota, Dallas, Minnesota, even too. Yeah, I think a lot of people had Dallas winning that one. Minnesota's leading two to one. So let me hear from you guys. Is there a specific uh, series that you're most surprised about? I would, I would say the Kings won for me. I'm not going to go too in depth with it. I honestly had the Oilers beating the hell out of them four to zero in the series. So. Well, you were around very quickly with that one. Yes, I was. But, I'm, I'm, I mean, that's a big one. The other one I was looking at is Dallas, Minnesota. Like, I thought Dallas was just going to make a blow out of Minnesota, honestly. I thought that was going to be a quick series, too. But we got Minnesota leading them right now. I'm like, what is going on? Dallas usually has the high points, but their goaltending on Minnesota's end has just been outstanding for the series so far. Yeah. Like, they're doing great over there. I think they had one bad game, but, you know, it's the playoffs. You're going to have high-scoring games. You're going to have really low-scoring games. I, like the uh, the the finals, that's what I'm hoping for. Five goals max, everybody. <laughs> All right, Leslie. So what, what was about, your prediction? What about and, you, buddy? Hey, it can still come true at this point, right? It, w- it won't be wrong until the finals. So uh, I think out of all these series, my biggest surprise is Winnipeg and, and Vegas. Like, if you remember back to my bracket, I had Winnipeg getting swept. I I really would have thought that all the alleged issues they've had in their locker room is going to be a little bit of a distraction. They kind of stumbled into the playoffs just with the nature of the West being the West. And they look really good. I mean, the last game that they even played, it was, uh, I almost have it here. Sorry. Five to four Golden Knights in the second overtime. Yeah. I mean, they're not going away. They're not just laying down and dying like I thought they would. Uh, Yeah. I mean, Vegas is still leading, but it's not like they've been stomping them. It's been really close games. And let's be honest, Winnipeg outplayed them in the first game. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm I'm very surprised at that result. I still have Vegas winning that series, but it's not going the way I thought it would. And, yeah, the Isles, I can't really say that's a surprise. I mean, their power play it has to be the worst in the league, if not one of the worst. It's absolutely atrocious. They They actually didn't even get one last night or two nights ago. It was literally right after the power play ended, and all the announcers were like, there's your first power play goal. No, it wasn't. I mean, yeah, we'll take it. We need it, but it actually wasn't. But, yeah, they've been atrocious. Um, I can't really be all that surprised. I can't really be all that upset. We're going to get a good draft pick. It could be Gabe Perot. You never know. He's been on fire. 
Yeah, there you go. That's a good segue. So let's go ahead and jump into that. So I wanted to speak on the U18 Men's World uh, Championship Tournament that is taking place over in Switzerland, like we talked about in the last episode. So majority of the teams have played their third game. I think actually every team has played their third game now. Um, I've been trying to keep a close eye on it, the ability to work remote, so I get to watch some of the games since they are um, a little bit earlier in the day. So, uh, yeah, sorry, Derek. I know you don't get really to watch any of them, and same as you, Leslie. But, uh, yeah, I mean, looking at the scoring leaderboards right now, USA is on a tear. I don't know what they're feeding these kids, but they've been playing with each other for a really long time, so that definitely helps them out in that regard. I wouldn't be surprised if they walked away with gold uh, at the end of this tournament, uh, number one in terms of ranking for point leaders, you got Gabe Perot and Will Smith tied. They had the same amount of goals and assists and points with four goals, seven assists each, 11 points. They're both plus eight. Uh, then third on the list is Ryan Leonard. Uh, he's got eight points, three goals, five assists. He's a plus seven. Then you got uh, 2024 eligible draft pick Cole Iserman with six goals, one assist. Uh, he's a plus two in the tournament as well. Then you finally get over into some Swedish players. Otto Stenberg, I believe he's the captain for the team. He's got three goals, four assists in his three games with a plus eight. And then one of my favorite prospects at right-handed uh, defenseman, Axel Sandin Pelica. The boys will attest to that, that I love this kid. In his three games, he's got two goals, four, six, four, six points, and he's a plus seven. Oliver Moore, uh, he's got five points. Richie, or Colin Ritchie, he's got five points. Uh, and then Macklin Celebrini, he is a 24 draft pick as well. And he's got five points in three games, uh, plus one as well. So we got some really good talent that's going to be moving up their way in the draft boards. You know, once these mock drafts start coming out more and more, I know that some of the latest rankings came out in March. So some of them aren't up to par with some of these players like Gabe Perot. I see Gabe Perot going anywhere in the 20s and 30 range. After this tournament, if this kid finishes with over 20 points, I don't see how there's a way that he's just going to fall in the 20s. He's 5'11". He's good size. He There's just a lot to like about his game. When I watched the the game today that they played against, uh, oh boy, I think it was Finland. Um, I could be wrong, so pardon me on that. But uh, yeah, no, I just like what he brings to the table. I like what majority of these players bring to the table. Yeah, it was against Finland, 8-4, to four, USA won today. Woo, thank goodness I was right. So we won't touch too much more on that. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right into our player rankings for the defensemen, goalies, and then we'll do the team overall as well. And just to remind you guys of the rules, we are not doing players that played less than 10 games. So no Simon Edvinson, and we're not touching on players that were traded. So no Philip Peronic as well. Um, we are touching on all the goalies today. Uh, since it was just easier to do that way, everyone got a goalie. So, Derek, you are up first. Looks like you got Jake Wallman, buddy. So why don't you go ahead and take it off for us? Ooh. I got baby Jake Wallman, man, up here. Got Leslie's favorite defenseman for the Red Wings, and I love I got him and not Leslie just to make him a little more salty up here. But Wallman coming in at 6'2", 215 pounds, left wing a defenseman. This is some dude that Stevie's been looking at ever since his day in Providence. So that tells you that there is something to be looking at with, there with him. He ended the season only with 18 points in 63 games, but he had the best plus minus on the team for 10 points. And that's great for a defenseman. So that's something to look at. We don't got to always look at his points. You got to look at the plus minus for a D because that shows out like how they're actually doing as a defenseman throughout the year. I mean, he just signed his three-year contract. I think we got a good steal with him with that 3.4 for an AAV for him. So that's not bad at all. He brings a lot to the table. I think he, even like with him being up there in the top line, he brought Cider out of his little stint there. He, I think he adds a lot to what's going on for everybody. And honestly, I'd rather have him 100% next season because he's definitely been out a little bit this season. We haven't really got a full stretch of him yet, and I really don't think anybody really has since he started playing hockey. From what I remember, it looks like, yeah, after being at St. Louis, he, not a full season there either. So, But I'm really excited with what he brings to the table, and I think we get him actually like a full, healthy Wallman coming in next year. 
I think he will do a lot for the team and he'll bring a lot more to the table and actually do a lot more than what we think he can do. And as long as he keeps that defensive stride up, I'm ranking him around a A minus right now. How are you guys feeling on that? Yeah, Jake Wallman is just a revelation to this team. It's like before his his uh, breakout year this year, we were looking at this left D on the Red Wings, and we were saying to ourselves, oh, my God, can we please have all these left D prospects pan out and do it fast because, Jesus, we need help here. Then Jake Wallman said, you know what, guys? I don't think you got to worry anymore. You got a Jake Wallman on your team. Don't cry anymore. Yeah, he's a fantastic player, just – I, you you saw immediately when Sherratt was bumped off Sider's pairing and Wallman went up there, just the instant chemistry they had together, which I think having a solid partner for Mo Sider alone is worth getting the deal that he signs. And he's he's just a really solid player. I mean, he's he's just always defensively doing what he needs to do. It doesn't really matter what player he's covering. It could go all the way from a fourth liner to Connor freaking McDavid, man. I mean... It really doesn't matter. He just plays such a solid game that he can shut down pretty much anyone in the league. And he has a lot of untapped offensive potential. He's got nine goals, nine assists. He's got a hell of a shot, too. I imagine if you can get a true net front presence in front of the net, he's going to have a lot of tip-ins and have a lot more assists. That's just how good and accurate his shot is from the point. I just really like him, man. He's a super solid player. I, I think he's going to be a staple on this blue line for, honestly, years to come after this contract. And this money he's making now, it's well-deserved. I think you're going to see a big season out of him next year now that he has a little bit of, like, renewed confidence in himself now that he knows that the team and the general manager trust in him by sending him to that deal. So, yeah, I, I only expect more good things to come from Jake Wallman. I'm giving the dude a solid A. Pressure's on me now. All right, well... I guess let's just go ahead and start from scratch on how we actually acquired Jake Wallman on March 21st, 2022. Steve Eisenman traded Nick Letty and Luke Wachowski to St. Louis Blues for Oscar Sundquist, Jake Wallman, and the 2023 second round pick. Uh, we still own that pick. That's going to be the 42nd overall pick in this year's draft. Um, I mean, looking back at it now, when this trade happened, no one really knew too much about Jake Wallman and what he could do for us. Now, uh, Jake Wallman was probably the centerpiece of that deal back then. You were saying, okay, we got the second round pick back that we spent for Nick Letty, and then we basically got these two players because St. Louis needed cap space. They needed the room. Yeah, Jake Wallman, what a what a trade piece in that. And this kid has done nothing but great things so far. Uh, yeah, he was injured a little bit, so he had to miss the start of the season. That's okay. But he came in hot. Uh, and he continued throughout the whole entire season, hot in my opinion. And yeah, being with Mo Sider, that's nothing but great for him. And yeah, this is someone that I could see possibly being with the Red Wings for a long time, even after this current uh, contract that he had signed uh, during the season, right before the trade deadline. So I'll give him an I'll give him an A minus. Yeah, A minus. So I like it. Solid A minus for Wallman. Yeah, A minus, A minus, A. I think that's a good grade for him. Yeah, he he didn't do any bad things. He did a lot of good things. He was the one who got us that dub against the Pittsburgh Penguins. Um, then there was a game towards the end of the season where he won. I think it was against a Carolina game uh, with like three seconds left or something like that. He, yeah, he scored for us for us to win the game too. So, yeah, I think that this is a player that we can. I don't want to put expectations on him, but I think thirty points is definitely in the realm for him. To be honest, 18 points in 63 games, I think he could get 30 points if he's paired with Mo Sider the whole entire season. So keep an eye out for that. And speaking of the ball, I think he could get even more. He could. Yeah. He definitely and I, I, that's something I forgot to even mention. Like, it seemed like every time he scored, it was in the most clutch moments. I mean, there was that 4 nothing comeback in Pittsburgh and literally the buzzer beater in Carolina. Those are two of, like, the biggest moments of the season. And guess who made those moments happen? Jake Wallman. Yeah. So let's go ahead and talk about his defensive partner. That would be Moerit Siders, uh, everyone's favorite right-handed defenseman in the world, I would say, right now, currently. Other people might disagree with me, but if you're a Red Wings fan, yes, you well, will. If you ask me, I'll say yes. So Mo Sider, 
He's 22 years old, from Germany, 6'4", 205 pounds, shoots right. He was a 2019 first-round draft pick, number six overall by the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, this season, in 82 games, he had five goals, 37 assists for 42 points. Eight points short of last season, he put up 50 points, seven goals, 43 assists. This kid's just a stud all around. Uh, he had a down start of the season being paired up with Ben Sherratt. I don't know exactly what the deal of that was. Um, ben Sherratt is just a gaping black hole, I guess, <laughs> to say the least. So, um, I, mean, I think worry, we've I covered all about him that time so far. I mean, this kid is just I, – I, I think the Red Wings are poised to sign him sooner rather than later this upcoming season or this off season, I believe is when they can sign him to his extension. I think that this is someone that you have to sign him to his eight year it deal is. yeah, or at least sign him to a deal that takes him to the year before he becomes unrestricted free agent. And then you sign him to that eight year deal. So that way you just maximize how long you keep him for. And then by the time he's like in his thirties or something, and for some reason he doesn't want to be with the wings anymore. Fine. You're, you're basically out of your prime. We got the best out of you, hopefully, at that point. But this kid, he's going to he's gonna be good until he's in his mid to late 30s. I swear. There's, there's nothing wrong with this game. He does all the little things right. He's hard to get off the puck. He know, Granted, he only got five goals, but this kid knows how to make nothing into something. Like, there were plenty of times where I saw a shot from him, and I was like, that was – I wouldn't be surprised if he's someone who could – get 10 to 15 goals in one season if we just put the right pieces together. Um, kind of like a John Carlson situation with the Washington Capitals. I think that that is very doable. John Carlson's not far removed from having a ridiculous season. Um, I think he was like a point-per-game season player two or three years ago. I had him in fantasy, and I was like, okay, I'll, I'll gladly take this. And I think Bo Sider could pan out to being someone who's exactly like that as well. I mean, he eats minutes, too. Game in, game out, he's putting up 22 to 25 minutes a night, depending on if they're going into overtime or in a shootout, you know, whatever it is. But, yeah, for me, I love what he brings to the table. Other than the mishap with the start of the season being paired with Ben Sherratt, I I think it's an A- minus for me, too. I mean, like I said, the minutes that he, that he ate up, I mean, granted, he was a minus 11. I don't think that really affected him that much. He did get a little more penalty minutes. Um, I still don't think that that hurt him that much either um i think the mishap is just an unfortunate circumstance but he really quickly turned it around when he got paired up with jake woman so yeah a minus for me i mean there's not much else to say on the guy like you guys said it pretty much all he after shira got switched out for wallman he had like a blowout season not really a blowout but he definitely did it better than I was expecting him to do. And if he keeps that up in the top tier line like that, I would expect some more things out of him, especially down the road, especially with Wallman. Like, I hope those two stay paired up because it's looking like a great matching right there, right now. So if he keeps up the way he's doing it, I give him a, a, B, a B plus, A minus in that. Eh, B plus. <clears throat> A little harsher, but B plus right now, just because of the beginning of the season. Because I want you to be able to work with everybody. Yeah. If you can't work with everybody, it's going to downgrade you a little bit. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Yeah, for sure. Go ahead, Leslie. Man, I am surprised to see these grades you guys are giving out. Like, I get that you're taking the whole season into account with these grades, but you got to look at what he was doing early in the season. He was paired up with the boat anchor of all boat anchors in the league, which... Don't worry, we'll get to him. He's up next. I have the the misfortune of talking about him, or I guess the fortune, depending on how you look at it. But, yeah, Mo Sider, his the first, whatever it was, 10 or 15 games, you can pretty much look at whatever bad set you want to look at. The turnovers, giveaways, plus, minus, it pretty much all came from being paired up with Sherratt. And ever since he had a solid, reliable partner in Jake Wallman, I mean, this dude was just lighting up the league, like, I think we're still finding surprises about him that we didn't know last year. Like that Boston goal, that backhand roof, I had no idea he had that in him. And he has so much offensive upside. I don't really see why we haven't seen it yet. I think he's still trying to build a little bit of confidence and almost kind of trying to figure out exactly what he wants his game to look like in the NHL. I really feel like this dude is capable of a point per game, maybe 70 points in a season. Yeah. I really think that's his ultimate ceiling. Um, I, I hope he's locked up 
on a long-term deal. I hope he's here for the rest of his career in Hockey Town. He's our franchise defenseman. I don't want to see him play anywhere else. I want him to be, you know, we always have these parallels to Tampa Bay where Steve Eisman was. I want him to be in the next Victor Hedman here, and I think he can be. I mean, Victor Hedman is a Norris-winning defenseman. I look into my crystal ball. I see a Norris in this future. I really genuinely do, and I don't think that's a crazy thing to say. He's just an incredible player overall. And I I just, I love that, like, every aspect of his game is just exactly what it needs to be for your number one defenseman. He can hit. He shuts down superstar players like McDavid. He, he can do it all. He can do it all. And once he enters his prime, you're going to see a lot more points put up by him. So I got to give the dude an A+. plus. I really don't know what else I can give him. I think I'd be doing him a disservice by giving him anything other than an A+. Plus. I mean, he's just, he's everything I want and more. And I know Zach wants me to keep things short, but <laughs> I really do not think I can keep this one short. And I don't think you guys even want me to because bore you in for a rant. Everyone's absolute favorite, overpaid, boat anchor, just horrible all-around defenseman, awesome offensive lineman of hockey, Ben Sherratt. Four years. $4.75 million. I guess I don't even really need to say that because people know what it is by now and how horrible it is. Yeah, the dude, uh, I'll pull up his stats right now. Uh, I'm going to try and stall a little bit while I'm doing that. Fill the air. But, yeah, so here we go. 19 points, minus 30. So we know the plus minus is more of a reflection of the team you're playing on. But when you're a defenseman and your minus is that low, what other picture does that paint? I mean, this guy, you've seen it all season long. No matter who is playing with him, he drags them down because he is just an anchor to end all anchors. I mean, just, I, okay, so before I really, like, go into, like, just my whole spiel, I don't want this whole thing to be negative because if I wanted to, I could do that. I don't really want to. I think when he's in the offensive zone and he has the puck on his stick, he is really, really good at making things happen. I really think that's a strong suit of his game. Yeah. The only drawback is you don't want a guy making that much money to only have that part of his game be strong. And he is a physical player. I, I think he was really signed more so just to bring that little <laughs> like snarl and grit and just that kind of like toughness to a roster that, let's be honest, still doesn't really have it and is still lacking it. I think that's one of his best traits. But yeah, I mean, th this isn't an analytical category, but maybe it should be. His bad decisions per 60 has to be one of the highest in the entire league. <laughs> I do not understand what is going through this man's head when he is on the ice. But just immediately when someone has the puck on their stick on the other team, he will just blow whatever assignment he has and just go like a freight train towards the dude to try to get the puck from him. Which, obviously, when you're an NHL caliber forward and you see an opening, you're going to take it, and more often than not, it's going to score. I mean, we've seen it at least a dozen times this season where he's just left this guy wide open, and the guy's like, oh, okay, I'll saucer one over there, and this is a sure goal. So, I I just, I don't really know what else to say. I, part of me hopes that just this season... It was kind of him slowly trying to figure out what style of play this team is doing. But then I thought about it, and I was like, well, you've been in the NHL for whatever it's been, eight or nine seasons. You should probably know how to mold your game into a style that the team needs. And let's face it, at this point, he's not going to do it any different. He's 30 years old. He's going to play the same game that he's always known. So I don't know. I think next year going forward, just forget about whatever money he's making because you can't change that unless you buy him out or trade him, which no one's going to want to trade for him, and the buyout is the worst option. you got to bury him on the depth chart. This guy has to be playing third-pairing minutes. I think he's a solid third-pairing defenseman. I I, I don't know. I, you're going to have to shelter him a little bit, but, yeah, we, we can't have him eating up minutes like he did this year. He's just a liability out there, and I unfortunately don't think it's going to change. I want to give him a D based on the fact that he asked for that much money and is making that contract. I have to give him an F and I don't think that's too harsh. 
All right. Leslie, yeah, you made some really good points. I mean, like, at the start of the season, like, it was pretty bad. I mean, throughout the whole entire season, it was pretty bad. Up until towards the end, I will say I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Once he got pushed over to the right side, he was paired up with a defensively sounded player, Ole Mata. That's when he started to thrive a little bit more. He wasn't doing the blown miss assignments, um, going and chasing someone across the other side of the ice and leaving someone wide open to score on us. Um, yeah, his offensive skills are definitely there. I mean, towards the end of the season as well, I kind of saw that too, where he was taking the puck and entering the zone with it and actually utilizing his skill set to create open space for the team to get into the opposing zone. So I really liked seeing that out of him. I think it's not, and I hear what you're saying. He asked for all that money. He, he can ask for as much as he wants. It comes down to the general manager to agree to that contract. So that's on Steve for giving him that much. It's the same thing with Justin yeah. Alligator and Ken Holland. Hold on, Leslie. I get hold that. On. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> but right. It, it's, it's too much for too long. Um, obviously, the first pairing is not suitable for him. That's just a little too much to ask from someone who is 30 or 31 years old. Um, this is someone who's never gotten more than 26 points in his whole entire career in a season. So, and yeah, this is, this was by far his worst defensive year ever. Um, but I think that that probably did change around once he get, did get paired up with Ole Mata. Now, in terms of what's going to happen at the, or going into next season, whether if he's traded or bought, bought out, I don't think he'll get bought out. Could he get traded? I think there's an opportunity there. But I think Simon Edvinson has to force that trade to happen. And I think that's partially why Steve Eisenman signed and extended Ole Mata and Jake Wallman. Because he's firmly okay with those two. It's okay, can Edvinson push out Sherratt? In worst case, then we just keep him on the right side. If the Red Wings don't sign a right-handed defenseman in the offseason, there's Ben Sherratt for you. It, it is what it is. Um, but for me, yeah, I think I'm right there with you. I think I'm going to give him a D, um, maybe a D- minus because. I don't like – I didn't mind the signing at first, but then after watching the whole entire season of him play in the 76 games that he did play, I mean, 19 points minus 31, <clears throat> that's bad. Um, yeah, D, D minus, actually. I'm going to give him a D minus. Go ahead, Derek. Well, everything you guys said is completely true, and Leslie pretty much stated the facts there for you for his entire season with the Red Wings, which by far is his actual second longest season in the NHL. But I understand where Steve was coming from when he actually drafted him, because if you look at his profile with all the teams he's played with, he's been to the playoffs quite a bit, and his record beside, like this year is his worst on record, the worst he's played. Like, negative 31 before this, like, up to his 2020 season, I think the worst was, a ne looks like a negative 9 he's played with in 70 games with 10 points. I mean, a negative 9 for a defenseman isn't bad. And then he's been to the playoffs seven times. Last time with Florida last year, and he only went negative 1 that year in 10 games, so... Obviously, I see where Stevie was coming, where we need a defenseman with the skill and the playoff experience, but he did not transition over. Again, he's 31 years old. What we've got for him is probably in the past, those last, like, between 2018, 2021, those probably his prime time. Now we're just kind of getting that last leg of him. And he sucks with us. <laughs> I mean, until he got switched to the right-handed side, it wasn't anything I wanted to watch. I mean, the only thing that switched up with him when he got switched over to the right-handed side, we didn't hear a lot of complaints about him that was it nothing great about him it was just we couldn't complain as much about him so obviously with all that ranking into his like an overall grade i give him a solid d minus just from his past experience and then this year i mean i can't can't fully say an f but d minus like just because of what he showed with the team not good yeah yeah i think the consensus is d's all around yeah, I think that's more than fair, to be honest with you guys. Leslie, it, it sounds like that you do have a little bit more that you want to touch on. I'm sorry for being a little rude to you when I was going off. Sorry. Well, <laughs> I think the only thing that I want to round it out with is, yeah, Steve Eiserman is responsible for signing him to that contract. But, you know, it takes two to tango. I mean, Sherratt was asking for that money and expecting to get it. So if you're making 4.75 every year, you owe it to your team, the fan base, the GM, the, like the city of Detroit, you want to everybody 
to play up to that number. He hasn't even come close. So that's the only gripe I have. And I can give him an benefit of the doubt. That was just the market last year. There was a similar defenseman who was probably on Schrott's level of terrible, who got $4 million. <laughs> So that was just the market. I get it. They needed a, a defenseman. I don't know. That's, it is what it is. Yeah, it is what it is at this point. Yeah, hopefully he can turn it around next season. Hopefully it's a little bit better. Derek, you're up next. You got your boy, uh, Haggy boy. I got a good old Robert Hag, a 28-year-old left-handed D who started out with Philly. Another Swedish defenseman, by the way. We just mean, we, I swear, all defensemen nowadays are just Swedish. I don't know why. Good Anyone in their prime, at least. Yeah. I know. I mean, I can't complain. They're producing something I like to see. I mean, well, you know, we got Robert Hag here, who is okay. <laughs> I mean, overall, Hag is a pretty basic defenseman through his entire career. I mean, I think he's probably been averaging, it looks like, around 20 points a season at his best. And probably around a negative five throughout his NHL degree in total points, I guess. So that's not bad, a plus minus of negative five in total. I mean, he hasn't done too much with his size in general. He's a big boy coming in pretty large here. What is he at? I believe I have him up. Robert Hag, I do. There he is. 6'2", 207 pounds. Not massive for a D, but pretty good size still. So he has a lot that he could bring to the table that we're hoping that he would have brought over. But at the same time, I just haven't seen the utilization that I he would have brought over from like the years prior, I think. Like, if we pull him up here, it looks like he got drafted by Philly, which isn't bad. He played in the AHL a lot for a while, but obviously, like, you go through his stuff, nothing crazy. He played for Florida a little bit, Buffalo, Philly for most of his career. Pretty average defenseman. Like, he did some good, he had some good plays with Detroit, obviously, but not a high point producer. Only 19 points this year in 76 games, which isn't, nope, wait, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to look at that guy. He only played 38 games this year, so he wasn't fully healthy either. But again, seven points, negative five, not where I'd want to see him for a half a season. That means he's probably around negative 10, negative 12. We played full season. So in general, I think he would be a good player to have the knowledge, but I'd keep him at the lower end of the D rankings instead of where he is. I'm pretty sure, what is he, number two right now, ranking in the lineup? can't remember fully i think he's a lot lower than that oh i think he's actually a third d spot so that makes a lot more sense so we'll keep him there i mean he's like a good amount of knowledge that could bring to the younger players though so that's what i think we have him there for but obviously i want to do more than a year more extension which i believe he's actually coming up oh my god this computer i'm gonna break it <laughs> not really because then i can't do anything <laughs> Yeah, this is his last contract here with us. So, obviously, I don't know. An extension might be something. i do a low-ball one, but mainly I'd probably keep him in the AHL and use him as, like, a back burner if we need him to pull up or if we need him in the third line, and we'll switch him out with our prospects that we have coming up. That way, they all get some time up, but that way we have him as, like, that one guy that we know we can rely on on the third, but then we can swap him out for somebody in the AHL that's going to be good, like Edvinson or something like that, bring them up, swap those two out, get them some playing time, see what they do, and obviously try to find a better fit for the line because a third line D at his age, he doesn't have really much left to bring to the table, especially since he's probably supposed to be in his prime at this point. But in all, just because of his experience and what he can do, I give him a solid C plus, B minus. That's a lot nicer than I would have done. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, Leslie, I kind of figured I, I was high ranking him just because I want the experience. Here, I'll, I'll make my well, quick. Well, you know, the thing about Robert Hag is – oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'll make mine quick. Yeah, he's he's a seventh-pairing defenseman. He's the extra body. That's what he was signed for. Yeah, seven points in 38 games. Um, There's not much more that you're going to hope out of his career. I'll be surprised if we extend him. These are. This is a prime player that you can find in free agency all over the place that you can sign for 750K for the one year. I'm giving him – I mean, when he got called up, he did his job. He's got 26 penalty minutes, though, in 38 games. I mean, um, he, he did some good things, but also, like I said, he's a seventh-pairing defenseman. He just can never crack the lineup, as you can see. He played one full season 
um, almost two with the Philadelphia Flyers six years ago, seven years ago. So I D plus D. Well, I, I just kind of want to point out that Robert Hag was never really intended to be on the roster. He was actually signed because the Red Wings signed Mark Pesek for that third pair yeah. slot. Yeah. And then he, I don't know if he broke his Achilles or broke his ACL or his Achilles, whatever it was, it was an injury that kept him out for the whole year. So we needed a warm body to replace him. Yeah. That was Robert Hag. I mean, yeah, seven points as a defenseman, like, I guess he did his job. There's really no reason to re-sign him because wh- however shallow this pool may be in free agency, you can get a bonding pairing guy. Like, I think about a guy like Scott Mayfield, Connor Clifton, which we'll get to the free agents as the show rolls on. But I think about, like, those guys like that, that's good value for the bottom pair. You don't really need to bring Hag back. You have other options. Um I mean, I, I want to give him a D, I guess. I don't really want to go lower than that because he did do his job. He was invisible most nights, but he he tried, I guess. He tried his best. So, D. He was a body that we needed, that's for sure. Exactly. So, the next player that we have on here would be my boy, Jordan Osterley. Uh, 52 games, 11 points, our boy. Two, 2 goals, 9 assists. Um... He's on contract for, we signed him for two years, 1.35 mil per year. That was signed last year. Uh, so his contract will be ending this this year. Um, this guy was up and down in the lineup, um, in and out in the 52 games. I don't remember if he was ever injured, so I think he was also technically considered a seventh pairing defenseman at some point for us. Um I think that's a little much for what he brings. Um, he's never played a full season in the NHL. Uh, he's played with Edmonton, Chicago, Arizona with us. Um, D plus. I think uh, he was just like out of all of our like sixth, seventh D men. He was, I'd say, the most reliable. Yeah, I mean, kind of just there for veteran presence, and he's a hometown boy. Um, we really don't need to bring any of these guys back. I mean, they're all easily replaceable in free agency, like I said, with Robert Hag. Um, I think I'll give him a C-. minus. He is a former Bronco, and I ride with my former Broncos. So, for that reason, he gets a C- minus instead of a D. I mean, yeah. You can't... There's not really much to say. I think we're all just trying to get on top of each other to get it out there right away. But, yeah, he's... Just your basic third liner. He's basically another Robert Ag, like uh, Leslie was saying. Nothing great. What, 19 points in 52 games with a negative nine with us? Like, not terrible. Never played a full real season. He's just that filling guy that we had brought up. He's not terrible. Like everyone said, he did the job that we needed. So, Go all around, back to it. I'll give him a solid C just because he did what he needed to do in the time frame that we had him up here. Would I re-sign him? I don't know. Probably not. But at the same time, let's see what we have there on free agency. If we can't find anyone better, bring him back for another year at 750. Who cares? That won't be too bad. Man, I'm just getting all the fun ones tonight because now we got Gustav Lindstrom. Um, You know, out of all of our bottom pairing guys, this is the only guy who is RFA. So, I guess he'd be the only one I bring back just because he is still under team control. Um, he's still young. I don't think there's much upside in this game. I don't think he's going to be any better than what he is right now. Um, so I I don't know. I'd bring him back just at like league minimum, maybe nine hundred fifty k. I don't think that's a bad idea just to be like that seventh defenseman. Maybe he can split time between here and Grand Rapids. Um. Now, I do have an issue with him, which, unfortunately, this isn't really his fault, and there's nothing you can do about it, but he was taking the pick before Jason Robertson, so that's always nice. I love when I'm reminded of that. Uh, we could have had our next 100-point scorer here, and instead we got Gustav Lindstrom, so thanks, Ken Holland. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I want to give him a D. I think we'll give him a D+, plus because he, he is kind of a good-looking kid, so just based on looks alone, I'll give him a D+. Plus. Whoever said looks didn't get you anywhere. I'm gonna give him. I'm gonna give him a D minus. He didn't do anything to insert himself in the lineup. He 
I mean, last season he got to play in 63 games. He played in 36, and he's a right-handed defenseman. He shoots right. He should have asserted himself into the lineup a little bit more. He didn't take that opportunity. There were multiple times I caught him going to the box or giving up pucks to the opposing team. Yeah, I think I'm going to give him a D, D minus on this one. Who's up next? So that would be, yeah, I got the last one, then that would be Oli Mata. And uh, this is someone who just got an extension, like we mentioned earlier. He was originally signed to a one-year deal. He just got the extension for two more years, three mil each year. Um, and in 78 games, he put up 23 points. At the beginning of the season, this guy, this guy was going on a barrage of just scoring goals and just making some really nice plays. He... Um, almost caught up to his uh, overall point total in 29 points. He finished with 23, six goals, 17 assists. Um, he was short on his goals by one to match that and beat that. So this is a guy that you brought in to be the middle pairing defenseman. He does all the little things right. You know, this is a good signing by Steve Eiserman, in my opinion, and I'm kind of I was glad, but I was also confused why we extended him. I thought this was a prime candidate for us to trade at the trade deadline. Maybe you could get a second out of him, kind of like you did with Nick Letty. I'm glad that we have him. I think this is someone that – this is a guy who's been to the playoffs. He's won a cup. So if you pair him with a young right-handed shooting defenseman, if we can get one of those, two. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I figured it was two. I didn't want to be outspoken about it, but – yeah, I think, you know, he brings really good leadership. He's a really nice guy. If you watch any of his interviews, he is just a really down-to-earth guy, and he knows how to speak to people, and he's just really nice. Um, but in terms of what he brought to the team, yeah, I thought he brought a lot of good things, and he was someone who came in rolling really good. And other than that, you know, the production kind of slowed down, but he's just really good on the puck. He's hard to knock off, and he knows how to do the little things right. So I'll give him a B. Not all at once now. Come on now. I mean, I'll stick with that too. I'll give him like a, that B rating just because watching him, what he's done in his career, he's a very consistent player and he's doing a lot of good things when we watch him with the Red Wings. Like you said, he blew up at the beginning of the year and hopefully next year with we have a strong full lineup because I went through our injured people for the end of the year. We have a full line of our top pros- our top players out right now. Yeah. And if we bring all those people back and all having them all play at the same time with this new crew, I can see him easily getting a new high point total next year, especially for himself. Like I like the signing. Like I like I could see him, like you said, being that person we were going to trade off because he had the potential of getting us a little bit more. But I do think that we might have something good here with what Stevie's planning. So I mean, at two and a quarter, two for what was it, three years? I'll take that especially for a defense I mean, of his caliber. We'll get him at 31. We'll see how he's doing then. But at the same time, I think he'll pull something off for us. So I'll give him a solid B. Yeah. Yeah, Oli Mata was just that one guy to bring in in the offseason and solidify our blue line. And I really think he's done a good job of doing that. He was actually – I know we're not talking about him today because he got traded, but he was a big component of Bronick's breakout year, you know. Yeah. Bronick was always that guy who was offensive-minded first and he was a little bit of a liability. And I think Bronick got a little more confidence knowing that there was a guy back there who he could rely on and start leaning on his offense. So, yeah, I think, he, you know, he got that extension. I think it's well-deserved. I think he's a guy who, depending on what prospect comes up, if they can make the team – He'd be a really good guy to pair them with and kind of just learn the game from. So, yeah, I really like his game. He brings, you know, like that veteran leadership, that winning pedigree, winning two cups from Pittsburgh. So, yeah, I, I, I'm i happy with the addition. I didn't think much of it when he got here, but he's definitely left me – he's left me satisfied. So, I'm going to give him a B plus just so I can be different from you guys. Nice. Yes. <laughs> Derek, go ahead and let's uh, kick it off with the goalies, buddy. You got Magnus Helberg. Oh, yeah, I did. Thank you for that little gem there. The guy that's not even in our lineup right now, or ever will be again, most likely. Guy with the most uh, fancy transaction report. Let's go with that one. Going from us to Ottawa to Seattle, back to Ottawa, back to us in a matter of like three years. Don't know what happened there. Apparently, no one really wanted him. I mean, he. What can I say? Helberg shines pretty well in the AHL. He does what he does good down there, like averaging maybe like a two point four goals against. And he's. I mean, that's 
obviously not bad at all for a goalie with a 0.923 or something like that. I really don't care. I didn't look that far into it just because he's not really going to be here much longer. Like, I don't, we have a lot of goalies in our, like, coming up from the ECHL or the AHL right now that'll replace them pretty quickly. Like, he's not a bad backup goalie at times, but at the same time with his record this year, it wasn't pretty. What was it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Detroit Red Wings, 17 games, had a 3.29 goals against with a .885 save percentage. That's that's not what you're supposed to have your NHL goalie, especially at his age right now. Is at 32. Like, he's beyond his breakout year. He's just kind of an old boy now that should be in the AHL. Just down there training up all the guys to when they come up to the NHL. So... Obviously, I might extend his contract just at the bare minimum to keep him down there and hopefully drain people, but his overall rating, like, he didn't do anything great for the team this year. I give him a D minus, like, not a great NHL goalie, a great AHL goalie that might be able to train people, and that's about it at this point. Leslie, you can go. Yeah, Helberg was on waivers three times this year, and he was only brought over because Ned had a sudden, unexpected collapse and had to go back to the AHL. Um, I'm going to buy him a one-way plane ticket to Sweden and keep him there because he's flunking out of Hockey Town University. I'm going to give him an F. He just, he's not an NHL goaltender. I don't know how he even made it to the NHL in the first place. I'm sure he plays very well in Sweden. So, you know, go ahead. Stay there, build some snowmen on your off days, and just dominate the Swedish League. F. Oh, Leslie, to keep on that one, he does great in the Swedish League. I forgot to mention that. I don't understand great. why from the Swedish stay League there. that NHL it didn't produce over, but I think he has an average of a point nine three almost probably down there, a point nine two five. Works for me. Have fun. Um, have fun in Sweden. Send them back. Send them back. Let them have fun over there. So give you guys a little background he was drafted in 2011 in the second round 38th overall by the nashville predators um didn't really do anything to insert himself in the nhl but was always really good in the ahl in the echl um the most he played in the nhl before returning was two games in a season and that was with the new york rangers he posted a 1.53 goals against and a 929 save percentage now, fast forward to now, last season is when the Red Wings brought him in for that one game stint where he went three goals against and an 8-7 save percentage. I believe we still ended up winning that game. We oh, did. What a bad game. And then in the off season, yeah, I think he started with the Senators, waivers, Kraken, didn't play, waivers. I think he went back, whatever, however you guys said it. This guy, yeah, in 17 games, you guys know the stats. We already said it. In Grand Rapids, he was great. This is a guy who's a prime candidate to be on a team where they have two, they have a like an Igor Shesterkin, they have their backup, and then Magnus Helberg is your third string who's either waiting in the AHL for someone to get injured to call up. Like 17 games, I think that was a lot for him. He's not meant to do that. By far, he's not an NHL starting goaltender. I would even hesitate to say that he's not a backup either. Um, but I do think that if injuries happened, he could be a serviceable backup, but your team in front of him has to be really damn good if you want to secure those wins. Um, for what he did, I, I feel bad for the situation because he played majority of his stints. Like you said, Leslie, when Ned had his fallout um, and then when Huso was injured. So 885, we want to see at least a 9.9 .9 save percentage. Um, I'll give yeah a D plus. He did he he looks really good in some games. Some games he was dialed in, but majority of the time he wasn't. Um, the three two nine goals against you know that that's hard for a team on our team, especially our team who couldn't score five on five. So yeah, D D minus I think maybe D plus. All right, the next up we got Alex Nedeljkovic, Ned, um. I had a lot of high hopes on him coming into the season. I really would have thought that he and Huso would have kind of split the starts because, I mean, I guess you kind of saw from last year that I think his biggest problem is he's very inconsistent. He had a lot of good performances last year, but 
I think it was definitely evident that he cannot handle the workload of a bona fide number one NHL goaltender, but still be a very solid backup. That didn't really happen this year. He kind of strikes me as a goalie where if he has a couple bad performances in a row, he kind of gets down on himself, and it almost kind of seems like the mental game outweighs the physical with him because he is a very talented goaltender. I think, um, I don't remember the exact game, but there was a game towards the end of the season where he had, I think he had like almost 40 saves. So it's very clear that when he's on the top of his game, he can beat any team and he can steal you a game in the NHL. But yeah, it was definitely unfortunate for him this year to have to spend most of the year in Grand Rapids. I'm sure that's not the way he saw this season going, that's definitely not the way the Red Wings saw the season going. Um, I I would like to bring him back on another one-year deal next year to be a backup. The only question is, is he really going to want to sign a deal with a team who hit him in the minors all year? If I'm him, probably not. You can really find any of the 31 other teams that are needy for a backup, and I think he'd be solid there. So I think I want to give him, uh, I think I'll just give him a C-. minus. I, I think when he's on, he's a really good goaltender, but it's very clear that he's never going to be a starter. And if he can just kind of get his mental game under control, I think I'll be a solid backup. But based on this year alone, I think I'd have to give him a C minus. It was a little bit of a disappointment. Yeah, I, I'm going to give him a D. He put up worse stats than Helberg, and you're saying that you're going to ship Helberg to Sweden. So I, uh, looking at last season, yeah, he played in 59 games, 3.3. One way. And a 901 save percentage. Like, I don't think that should have went away, but I guess I shouldn't be surprised on what happened this season because the same thing happened with him when he was in Carolina. He was up and down through the NHL and the AHL. Now it's happening again. I think that this is just how Nadelkovic is as a player overall. I don't know if this is ever going to change. Would I bring him back for a year? Yeah, but like you said, does he want to come back to a team that was burying him in the AHL because of his poor performance? Probably not, but yeah, nonetheless, I think I would bring him back, but um, minimum, uh, probably a really cheap contract though, and it's not long-term either, probably just one year. Like I said, I mean, it's his track record is just up and down, up and down. I'm giving him a D. I was disappointed. I I thought it was going to be split between him him and Huso at the very least. He didn't even hit 20 games. Yeah, I'm giving him a D for disappointment. Yeah. I mean, in total, like, Helberg and Ned are basically the same goalie. Like, Ned just had more playing time down in the AHL, which obviously we can see both of them do pretty much the same down in the AHL. It just doesn't translate like we want it to up to the a- or NHL. Like, they have their shots of, like, brightness, as Leslie was saying. Like, we can see them doing well in certain games, which is that AHL bringing it up to the NHL. But if you don't do it the entire time, you're not going to be staying up. Like, you have to at least have, like, a .93 or higher right now, apparently, in the AHL to be brought up to the NHL and actually produce, it seems. And these two aren't hitting that mark. Like, they're doing well down there. But at the same time, like, I don't know if I would even bring Ned back. Like, obviously, I would just because it doesn't seem like we have much of an option right now. But would he want to stay like you guys are saying? I wouldn't think so. Like, unless we're going to bring up one of our top our goalies from the ECHL or the AHL that we might think are going to work out. What else can you do, really? You got to go with what you got. Hopefully, he might want to stay around one more year as a backup. But like you said, it's uh, very much his own choice, and there's a lot of teams that would probably take him right now. So in total, D+. plus. So I think I have to agree with you guys. Like When you look at Ned and Helberg in a vacuum, they're pretty much the same goalie. You then have to consider the fact that Ned can just out of nowhere just activate and steal you a game. I don't think Helberg has that ability whatsoever in his game. Like, I mean, yeah, overall, we're looking at a big five picture. Year age gap in there, too. So we have yeah, the Ned th- right now who is Helberg in five years. It's like, okay, I'll take that over the Ned right. or the Helberg. And that's the thing about it, too. But, you know, also Ned is, I think he's my age. So, like, he's pretty much already in his prime. And, like, if this is what his prime is, don't expect much more. But yeah, I think what you want in a backup is just a guy who you can throw in there and say to yourself, Oh, maybe he'll steal a game again. You know, yeah. I I've never been able to say that about Helberg. Yeah, what you're saying. I mean, but... just to let everybody know, 
I was going to say just Ned. Birthday, he's exactly one day younger than me. <laughs> okay, there you go. But going but go, going off of what you just said, Leslie, yeah, I think if you want a backup goaltender, you want someone that you know what you're getting from. I don't – th- there were plenty of games where you're like, what are we going to get from Nadelkovic tonight? I, yeah. That's not really something that I want to mess around with. And I think with Helberg, you know what to expect out of him. Like, he might be able to steal you again, but, but your team in front of him has to be playing really good as well. So, yeah, take your poison at that point, you know, if you had your choice, either one, you know, but maybe we change that up with free agency. Who knows? We asked this question before, so go ahead and look that up in one of our previous episodes. Uh, Maybe I'll tag it in the description because I can't remember which one it was. We've done so many already. So let's go ahead and move on to Vili Huso. Um, The numbers might shock you guys when you look at it. 56 games played, 311 goals against, uh, 3 point. 1 1 goals again, sorry, and a 0.896 save percentage. The league average right now, I looked it up, is just slightly over a 0.9 uh, save percentage. So he was just under that. He finished 26, 22, and 7. So he had a winning record. I just think towards the end of the season, you know, with all the injuries that really did him no justice, this was a guy who legitimately looked like a Vesna candidate goaltender at the start of the season this guy had there was he had uh i think at one point he had like two or three shutouts or something like that something crazy or at least like one goal against games this guy was stealing us games too as well um i loved way he brought and i know the stats aren't really pretty um but i think that that's you know ever since the trade deadline i think we did nothing but it kind of hurt his stats um so I know I'm supposed to grade the whole entire season, but I kind of want to remove after the trade deadline because I feel felt like that that's a little unfair to him. It, it was a surprise. It was basically getting Nedeljkovic last year, right? Like Ned, Ned was such a breath of fresh air that like Vili Huso was the exact same thing. But I would say that Vili Huso is more of a fresh air than Ned was last year. He's just so sound at goaltending. Like he does the small things correctly knows how to get in the spots that he needs to be in. And yeah, I would give him, I think I'm going to give him a B minus. Yeah. I think when you look at uh, Huso's numbers, you look at the A96, you look at the 311 GAA, you look at that in the vacuum and you might say to yourself, okay, well that's good, but it's not great. Then you have to remember that he played 57 games on the Red Wings. That is way too much for any goaltender not named Vasilevsky, Alibuck, just yeah, pretty much the cream of the crop, just Sturkin in in the NHL. Yeah, to add on top of that, Leslie, sorry. That's the most he's played in a full season. Before that, it was 40 games with St. Louis and 17 before that, and he never even played that many in the AHL either. So this was a lot. I don't think that that's that's a little too much for him to be playing on. So, yeah, you're right. Go ahead. Sorry. I just wanted to throw that out there too. And I'm going to imagine, like, the bulk of those numbers and why they look so down the way that they are is really just, like, the last, I don't know, nine or ten games of the season when he was starting and came back from injury. Like, the team was just absolutely depleted in front of him. They were doing him no favors. The whole, like, stretch of games ending up to the trade deadline, he was phenomenal. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. He was so good. He was stealing us games on a regular basis. Like, we know how bad this team has been at five on five and the power play hasn't been very good. It got a little better towards the end, but that probably the power play wasn't very good either. And when that happens and those two things are true for your team, you need a solid goaltender. And that's what we had in Billy Huso. I think the last stretch of his games, notwithstanding, I would put him up there with Larkin or Sider as the MVP of the team. I mean, he kept them in so many games that it's, it's ridiculous. And we know from looking at St. Louis, this dude was just a starter and waiting. I still don't understand why they didn't sign him in free agency. But, oh well, it is what it is. He's ours now. I really, really like him. I think until Kosa is ready to come over and take the reins in Detroit, he should be our starter going forward. And, yeah, I, I think based on that, I got to give the dude an A. He, he was phenomenal. I mean, he brought stability to the net that we haven't seen since, I don't know, 2016 Jimmy Howard. Like, <laughs> When was the last time we saw that? So, yeah, I got to give him an A for that. 
I mean, you guys pretty much said it all on your end. I, like he just, I think, especially after coming out of St. Louis last year with a two point five six nine point one nine, like he did. Gr- I'd say for himself being his first almost probably full ish season besides us this year with 56 games, like you said, is an excessive amount for one goalie to play. I think he's doing pretty well. Like this year was just a lot for him. And the fact that we had a team that like at the end of its rebuild, got stripped down a little bit, got tossed back in with new players and everything like that, trying to get used to everything, especially with injuries. I think he did well for what he was given. So in general, I'll give him a B on this one just because I think he's a good goalie. He's still like right about at his prime. So next year, I think we'll probably keep, or we're definitely going to keep him. I don't know if he'll, he'll probably be our main goalie for the next year and see what our next goalies bring up, but I'd keep him for now, give him a solid B just uh, hopefully we'll keep the same range. Just our team has to get a little bit better with the defenseman and the offenseman, and hopefully we'll pull together a good team and start giving some better stats out there too. Well, that finishes everything up in terms of grading each player that played with the Red Wings more than 10 games and who hasn't been traded. Um, So let's go ahead and talk about our overall team grades. Just kind of give like a one to two cents spiel and then kind of go into your grades doesn't really have to be talking about too much. And I want you guys to consider everything, the coaching, new coaching, new players, old players, stuff like that. So Derek, why don't you go ahead and kick it off with your overall team grade? Uh, I'm going on the fact that I'm hoping this is the end of the rebuild guys. I'm hoping this is what we needed. We got all the players are coming up to the draft, the lottery and all that good stuff through the prospects and whatnot. And it's going to just conjoin into a team that we want to see in the next couple of years, but we're focusing on this year right now. So the overall rating I give the team itself is a solid C plus just because we have some good players that are going to produce for us. Then we got some players on the back end that I could just dump into the trash can, or as Leslie says, give them a one-way ticket back to Sweden. <laughs> so overall, C plus for the team. We're not great, but we have potential for the next coming year. And with our coaching staff, obviously, we all complain about certain aspects, but it's Lalone's first year. So, and from what the Red Wings are saying, from what I can see with what they actually posted today, oh, I I got rid of it already. I think it was Detroit News Now or something like that. They talked about how most of the team was watching about how they actually have a really great staffing this year, how they break down everything really well for them, either in videos or in the game aspect. So I'm going to trust the guys on the team who are actually getting the lessons and pray that with the good coaching staff and hopefully the obviously power play switches around pretty quick for us and we start producing on that. And hell, our five on five needs a little work too. But I just think that's due to injuries, rebuild, and all that good stuff. So, solid C plus for the team this year. I like it. Leslie, you can go next. I think with this season coming in, I don't want to say playoffs are a long shot, but I don't think that was what everyone's expectation was. There was just so many new things going into the team. You know, we had a new coach implementing a new system. We had all of our new free agents coming in. We had a brand new goaltender. So, it was definitely kind of taking the team of last year and almost kind of giving it a facelift in the in a sense and just going in a different direction. I think there was, you know, highs and lows, just as any team has throughout the season, I guess besides Boston. Uh, screw you guys. Um, but, yeah, I, I think just based on the fact that this team right before the trade deadline was still in the wild card race, in the playoff race, in the bloodbath that is the Atlantic Division and more so the Eastern Conference – I think that's tremendous. And for a team of a first-year coach, to have your coach in that race when they haven't really been in a race like that since, like, the last year of the streak. So I think that's a phenomenal result. I think it's much above what we were thinking it would be. Like, yeah, there's still issues, like Derek pointed out, like the five-on-five needs to get better. The power play, I think, is one of the biggest things that needs to be addressed in the offseason, whether that's a coaching staff change or a talent change. I don't know, but it needs to be fixed. I think overall, it was above where I thought it would be, although they did finish lower in the standings, but they did have a higher point total than really a lot of previous year's teams. I think I have to give them a B plus. I think they overachieved a little bit. And I don't know, as, as this division gets tougher, I hope that the wings can match the the level of toughness and talent around them. And I don't want to declare playoffs just yet, but I think that needs to be the goal next year moving forward. 
Well, this is a team that got six more points than they did last season with a new coach. My expectations coming into the season was the same as it's been every year before Lalone was to, I want improvement from the players and I want improvement in the standings, the total. I'm not asking for a playoff team, but I definitely want to see improvements from every aspect you can. Their special teams were garbage last season. They fixed the PK on that end. I'm pretty sure we were a top 10 penalty killing team this year. That's amazing. I could be wrong, actually. I think we were middle of the pack. Regardless, it was much improvement because we were at the bottom of the league last season. Um, Power play got better. Five on five was shaky at times. We had a lot to ride on going into the season. You had a lot of excitement of new players that you brought in. Daddy P, you had returning Jacob Verana. You had, you know, Dominic Kubelik, who you thought could potentially get you 30 goals. Um, You were hoping Phil Zadina could get you 40 points this season. There's a lot of things we thought Nadelkovic would at least get 40 games in and potentially take over the starting role. A lot of things didn't happen that we made predictions on, and that's okay. Somehow we made it through. And like Leslie said, by damn near the trade deadline, we were a wild card team. We were right there. And had we not traded those players, there's a good chance that we could have been a wild card team. Would that have been good for the team? Yes and no. There's benefits and there's downsides to that. Um, overall though, I'm very, very pleased with what this team did. Lalone did a lot of good things. The coaching staff in general did a lot of good things for these players. Larkin took a step forward. Berggren took a step forward. Raymond kind of took a step back. Cider took a little step back, but came around eventually. Um, Valeno took a huge step forward too. I personally, in my opinion, um, Simon Edmondson, we got to see him. We got to see Marco Casper. Some other young prospects are starting to make their leap too. And I know that that doesn't really touch on the Red Wings, but I'm just so excited about this team. What's going to hold for them in the future. Overall, I think I'm going to give them a B. I think it went just as I expected it to. I didn't think that they were going to make the playoffs, but I wanted them. I thought that they could be better than they were in years past. And they definitely were better. And Leslie's right. The Eastern conference and the Atlantic division is tough. So regardless, we still did better than the previous year. So yeah, B, I'm giving it a B for the overall team grade. I like it. Like I said, I mean, it all depended. Lower. It really all just depended on what your expectations were going into the season. I mean, if I had the expectation of them making the playoffs and then potentially going into the second round, then I probably would have given them a D. But we know that that's just unrealistic. Mm-hmm. And what happened at the trade deadline going, you know, the last quarter of the season you know so i think i think a b if you're in the b range i think that's more than fair for this red wings team by no by no means wasn't an a they were perfect you know there were a lot of downs but i think that they had a lot more ups they weren't getting blown out as much as they were to last year either so you got to look at that as a perk too like there were a lot of they were really close in a lot of games the plus minus really hits you at home i mean like I, I think last season, what was it we talked about? It was like a minus 80-something. Now they finished at a minus 39. But at the trade deadline, they were like a minus 2. Mm-hmm. So a lot of good things happened with this team. So good on them. Hopefully they can transition next year. Yeah, like Leslie said, I don't know if they'll be a playoff team. Would I like that? Yeah, but I, it all depends on what Eiserman does in this offseason. So stay tuned with that. Well, we're done with that. We finally got that out of the way. We're sorry these episodes are long. We know. But we're not done yet. Let's go ahead and talk about Derek's favorite Russian, Metve Mitchkov, for our draft prospect profile. Um, does anyone have anything that they want to talk about? Or can I just go into his like little list on his elite prospects profile? Let her rip, baby. All right. So, Thanks, yeah. Kobe! Medve Mitchkov, uh, compared to being the next Alexander Ovechkin, basically, kid is just an offensive dynamo. He was born December 9th, 2004. He's 18 years old. He's a right-handed, right, or actually, sorry, he's left-handed, and he's on the right wing, so I read that weird. He's 5'10". On elite prospects, they have him at 148 pounds. 
But then you go on to uh, Hockey DB, and they have him at like 172. So I'm assuming that he's in the 170 range. We'll just go with that. Um, from what I've noticed, yeah, I, I said it. He's basically like an OV light. He's got a magnificent shot. That's just what Russia teaches those kids over there when they feed them the red bean soup or whatever it is that they feed them over there. Um, Pure cabbage. The his, his skating could use some work. Um, but against men, you know, it is what it is. He's a young guy, you know, he's really competitive. He plays with HK Sochi. Um, but he was traded from SK St. Peters Petersburg. He was playing in the KHL with them and then getting bumped down to the VHL. Um, in the VHL, when he was with them, he put up 14 points in 12 games with HK Sochi in 27 games. He has nine goal and 11 assists for 20 points. I mean, this kid, there were questions, and Leslie and I were talking about this before, too, is that before the trade, there were questions whether or not this kid was going to be able to insert himself top five in the draft because he just wasn't, in the three games he played in the KHL with SKA St. Petersburg, he put up no points, and then he gets traded, gets top line duties, and now he's kind of tearing it up in a men's league as an 18-year-old. So his shot is his best attribute, has some really nice patching, and that bodes with his hockey IQ. I mean, this kid's got unbelievable, unbelievable hockey IQ. Um, he scored a mission goal in, in, the, in the KHL game, too. So he's got the skill set to do some really nifty skill work. Oh, that was his last KHL game, too. Just remember that. Okay. Okay, so that's good to know. Last um, KHL game of the season puts a freaking Michigan game in. Yeah. He can get a little lackadaisical on the back check, and his overall compete level needs a little bit of work. He likes to curl off on the weak side, too, when he misses the opportunity to uh, forecheck on the opposing team. Um, that's just little things that he'll have to work on. It's not anything to really worry about. Um, overall, he might slide on the fact that he's rushing alone. They still got all those issues going on over there. Um, I'm not saying that that's going to stop him from coming to the NHL. I just think that maybe there's some teams that look at that and say, is this something that we really want to deal with? You know, there is a good chance that he might just say, maybe I want to stay in the KHL forever. He does have two more years on this contract, but that doesn't mean that he can't come to the NHL whenever he wants. He could, he could come over this upcoming season if he really wanted to. So he has that, but also let alone his his size. I mean, if he's 5'10", and if he is 148 pounds, that's an issue. But if he's 5'10", and 170 pounds, that's still on the smaller side. Um, you know, but I do think that this is a player that you're looking at choosing either in the third, fourth, or fifth spot, depending on which teams are picking in those spots. If, Wa if Washington gets an opportunity to get this kid, him and Ovi together, Ovi's going to tell that kid, yeah, you're coming over right now. And yeah. uh, I'm going to shoot you. How There's no chance they pass on him. Office and score those one tees like I do. So, yeah, I, I think he's a prime candidate to be in the top five. And I would love that the Red Wings could have him. I just, there's really no opportunity for us. I don't see him falling that far. And if the Red Wings win the draft lottery, you're taking Bedard or you're taking Fantilli. Um, I also don't think the Red Wings are in the mood to really deal with what Russia's got going on. We're just waiting for him to even make the team. I think if you're getting a talent like that, uh, it's going to be with a team that's willing to wait for him to come over. So that's my thought on it, at least. So, um, Leslie, or whoever wants to go next. When I, I think I, um, just the concern of him being a Russian player and, you know, that whole situation over there with the war and everything and his KHL contract. I think we even saw last year that taking Russians wasn't really that much of a big deal. Like there were two that went in the in the first round and then Steve went and got uh, Buchelnikov, which, you know, I, I think that kind of squashed that a little bit. Like I know that there are some concerns kind of just based on which GM – is picking for your team. But I think whatever doubts there are, this kid's talent level smashes through them. I mean, he is just an absolutely unbelievable talent. He's, I mean, kind of, he's kind of just Conor Bedard, but Russian. Like, he's a really, really creative player. Um, like Zach said, he's not the best two-way player, but 
when he gets in the NHL, I know that that can be taught to him. It's a lot easier to teach an offensive guy defense rather than the other way around. But, you know, a lot of people are comparing, comparing him to Alexander Ovechkin. I think he kind of pans out as more of like a Kirill Kaprizov player where he doesn't really lean too much on a shot, although it is very good. I think he has just incredible hockey IQ. I think he's a great playmaker. I really see him modeling his game the most after Kaprizov of the NHL. Um, I've seen him ranked as far down as number four on elite prospects, depending on who the GMs are when the uh, draft lottery is selected. Maybe you could slide past that, but I personally don't see it happening. There's no way he's going to nine with the Red Wings pick. They'd pretty much have to win the lottery to even get him, which if they win the lottery, they're taking Fantilia Bedard. I don't really know why they go Mitchkov. Right. But yeah, he definitely has the ability to be outside of Connor Bedard, the best player in this draft. I, I really don't think it's that crazy to say that. Like he's playing right now with HK Sochi, which I personally don't really know the hierarchy of teams in the KHL. I know a lot of the better teams are really kind of like, I guess, paid for. Like, they're kind of, like, inflated. Just, I don't know. That's a weird league over there. I don't really want to get into all that because I don't really know how it works, and it's all very confusing to me. But, (laughs) yeah, he's just, like, he's 20 points in 27 games, pretty close to a point per game. Uh, The one thing I do know about the KHL is it's a much higher scoring league than most European leagues, like the German league or the uh, Swedish or Finnish league. So, yeah, those are really good numbers for an 18-year-old, and you don't really see that very often over in the KHL, an 18-year-old playing on a men's team. I mean, pretty much outside of, like, Ovechkin and I think Kaprizov played when he was 18. It doesn't happen unless you're just a phenomenal talent. So, yeah, he is just an incredible hockey player. I think he has the upside of 100 points per season. I, I really think, like, he, he can just smash through whatever ceiling is projected for him. And... Call me an optimist, but I don't think the KHL contract is going to be that big of a deal. I do remember all the way back when Evgeny Malkin was selected by the Penguins, and I think he had a three- or four-year deal, and we were kind of, well, everybody was kind of thinking, like, well, we don't know when we'll see this kid, and it felt like the following season he just went over. I think the allure of playing in the NHL is going to outweigh that contract. I think we'll see him here sooner than later. So, yeah, he's an incredible player. Um, if he does manage to slide in whoever, whatever team picks him, they got their next franchise player right there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I believe he's going to be a franchise player too, no matter where he goes. So Derek, let's hear it from you. Let's hear about your Russian guy. Well, you guys covered pretty much everything in your 20 minute spiels there, but uh, I'm just going to go back to it again without him improving any of his game, doing anything different than what he's doing, he is basically described Ovechkin, which is not a bad thing to have coming in. Like, uh, Ovechkin came in the NHL his first year and had, like, 90 points right away. The kid's great. And if he does improve those aspects of his game, like his speed and his, um, what it was, his probably defensive knowledge a little bit, him getting back and forth, playing that two-way player a little bit more, then he's going to be, ended up being this, the, the prospect that everybody dreamed who should be a number one almost you know of course you got Connor Bernard and Fantilli up there obviously they're going to be better they're a little bit higher end than him I'd say in caliber wise probably a little more hockey knowledge too but it's more so showing just on their points that they have and they're in leagues that of course there's a lot higher scoring than over in the SHL and of course, that's a little bit more of a defensive league too so you don't throw that many points up but obviously he did which is really nice to see. So like you guys were saying, it's a franchise player. I believe whoever gets him, he will pretty much be that one player that you try to keep there to try to build your team, just like Washington and with Ovechkin. Like he's going to come in. If he gets better, he'll be even more producing than Ovechkin did too. So like Leslie said, who who do you compare him to that you want to be? Kaprizov. Kaprizov. Yeah. I could see him obviously, honestly being the next Kaprizov popping up in here and just blowing everybody out of the water. For comparison's sake, Imagine, yeah. Let me let me spill this out here first, Leslie. Did, for for, compar- yeah, go ahead. for comparison's sake, compared to Ovi, when Ovi was drafted in 04, that was when the NHL had their lockout season. So Ovi had to go back to the KHL. But that year that he was drafted, Ovi had already spent two years prior in the KHL. So he had been playing with grown men at the age of basically like 15, 16. And his first year there in 2001, 2002, he put up four points in 22 games. The next year, 15 and 40. And then his draft year, 24 and 53. 
The next season, he put up 26 and 37. Mitchkov really isn't that far off from that. So it's pretty interesting to see him compared to that in terms of like stat totals. So, and then like Derek said, yeah, the, that first year that he came and played in Washington, he put up 52 goals and 54 or 6, 106 points in 81 games. That is freaking insane. Could he do something like that? Jesus probably. Christ. I would it, love to see that happen with Mitch. It would depend on what team he goes to. If he, if he somehow manages to go to the Washington Caps, yeah, he might be able to put up a season like that. But yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. Leslie, go ahead. My bad, buddy. Well, so I have a little bit of a hot take, but I really do believe that as far as single season point totals go, I think he has the potential to surpass Connor Bedard. I mean, if I, I think that he would be the consensus number two in this draft over Adam Fantilli, who I think he's much more talented than Adam Fantilli. I think he'd be the number two if he was like Michael Smith from Saskatchewan and he was a corn fed, beer drinking, red blooded Canadian and he was playing for like the Moose Jaw Warriors. The, the, this dude would be number two consensus, maybe even spying, maybe even fighting for number one. That's how good he is. So I think that's about it for Mitchkoff. Anyone else? Derek, you got anything else on Mitchkoff? That's all I have. That's all I got. No, nah, no, nah, just the fact that, you know, if he does fall far enough in the draft, Red Wings, please take him. Oh, no, I won't oh, say man. no. Ignore the whole Russia, Ukraine thing. Pull him to us. All hail Magic Conch, fall to nine, please. <laughs> that would be great. I, I mean, if, if it Magic Conch, please. It, there, there's definitely an underlying issue if he does fall to ninth. But like Leslie and I said, if we win the draft lottery. But Leslie's Leslie's also right. Like if if Mitch Kov started his season with Sochi, I think he would be clear number two. So I think it comes down to the GM, the team, who wants Fantilli over the, or Mitch Kov, whichever one. It's going to come down to those two players for number two. We might see a situation like that where Mitch Kov is taken at number two. So who knows? Um, but if it were me... Um, I, if I had the second overall pick, I'm probably going to take Fantilli. Um, he's just a little bit bigger. He plays a little more harder game in my opinion. No offense to Mitch Goff. He's got a great shot and everything, but yeah, the, the, he's not as much of a two-way player, like you said, Leslie. So that might be the reason why some teams might not want him at second overall. So other than that, I, know I said I was done, but <laughs> now I am. So, uh, Let's go ahead and wrap it up. What's upcoming for us? We really don't even know yet. We're still trying to decide on what we want to do, incorporate in our episodes. What we do know is, is that next episode, we will continue to cover the playoffs. We probably will continue to cover the U18 World Championship uh, Tournament. Um, as Red Wings fans, you know, we have two really high picks in the first round, and we have three in the second round. So I'm trying to do my best to give myself as much knowledge about these players that are playing in this tournament as possible, so that way I could help you guys and utilize our resources and see who the Red Wings we're going to draft. So uh, next episode looks like we'll be doing a prospect profile of Leo Carlson. So that's a Swedish boy. If you guys are interested, make sure you follow up with us on the next episode, which we will be recording on Wednesday night. That will be airing on Thursday morning. So uh, other than that, I got nothing else, boys. So Leslie, Derek, final thoughts, one at a time. Go Red yeah, Wings. Yeah, I just want to... <laughs> <laughs> nice I still manage to do that at the exact it. same time. I always give him time, and then when he doesn't speak, I go ahead and speak, and then he talks right when I talk. How does that keep happening? Figure because we're on, like, a back feed. We all get it later than the next person when they talk. All right, Derek, God, man. Derek you right. go first. <sighs> Let's go, Red Wings. I don't know what this playoff season will bring us, but I'm hoping for at least 20 more fights in that Toronto Maple Leafs game against I'm Tampa. Let's have some more fun with that. It's looking just hectic, and I love it so much. And let's go Vegas if I have to say anybody to win the play the whole thing. That's I'd say just right now. Look at that oh, series. Yeah. Those are two teams to be uh, that no one's looking at that I think might have something to do in the future here. But, you know, let's go Red Wings. Let's get Mitchkov. Let's get Bedard. Let's get everybody. Let's have fun. You know what? Let's get silly for Fantilli, too. I don't care. Just get some good players, and I'll be happy. Get silly. All right, Leslie. I just want to give a shout-out to our boy, Davey Luplo. I know he's out there watching, so what's up, man? We love you. 
Uh, and let's go Oilers. They're down one nothing right now to the Kings. I really want McDavid. If it can't be Vegas, and it definitely won't be the Islanders, I want it to be the Oilers. I just want McDavid and Leon to win a cup. I really want it to happen. I want it to happen when when they're together. If one of them does decide to go off and do their own thing, I just hope they win. I love those guys. They're premier superstars in the league. It would be so, so good for the NHL if they won a cup. I mean, imagine how many fans that would bring in if the two best players on the planet won a cup. So let's go Oilers. And as always, let's go Red Wings. My final thoughts are Carolina in five. It's going to happen. Uh, New Jersey finally won a game. Maybe they can turn it around. Edmonton, figure it out, my dudes. My God. Vegas, yep. We're your number one fan over here. Um, Seattle, I'm still hoping for you in seven. Avs, you suck. I hate you guys. Uh, Let's go Red Wings. And uh, those are my final thoughts. So, and as always, let's go ahead and take a second to appreciate you guys. Thank you for joining us once again, for those of you that are returning, for those of you that are new. Once again, if you could, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That really does help us out more than you think. Uh, Make sure you're hitting the like button as well. Smash it. In fact, like this. Leslie smashes. And then, as well, hit us up in the comment section. We really like hearing from you guys. And make sure you're rating us five stars on Spotify. That also goes a long way for us as well. Helps our name get out there a little bit more. As always, tell a friend to tell a friend about Hockey Town University. That really does help us out. I think we are in the works of some production stuff. Uh, so wait on that. Hopefully we'll have that at some point this summertime. Mm-hmm. So, uh, maybe some swag or something like that. Who knows? Maybe we're talking about doing some giveaways too. So who knows? Stick around with us. You know, a lot of great things happening this summer. And as always, once again, thank you for joining us. As always, let's go Red Wings. Thanks for joining us on Hockey Town University, everyone. Goodbye.